Hello, and welcome to the Temple of the Silver Stars public class series, uh, Selection from Magic Without Tears. My name is Ruth, and with me is Rex, my co-host for this class series, the guy in the hat. <laughs> uh, we are both academic track instructors of the Temple of the Silver Star. Uh, the Temple of the Silver Star is a nonprofit philemic organization that's been around over 12 years and provides two tracks of training, academic and initiatory. Uh, and so you're seeing the academic sort of side of things here with this class. Uh, both tracks were designed to provide preparatory training in ceremonial magic, Raja Yoga, Kabbalah, Tarot, Astrology, and much more. Using these foundational tools, we seek to guide the student towards a deeper apprehension of the true will, the law of Philema, and his or her psycho-spiritual constitution. Um, and if you want more information on the Temple of the Silver Star, you can visit totss.org uh, to learn more about joining the academic track or being an initiate. Um, so we have academic campuses all over the world. Uh, I'm in uh, the Southern California area um, and Rex is in the, uh, well, he's the, he's the leader of the <laughs> Seattle group. Uh, he's located mm -hmm. at, not in Seattle, he's in California as well. I'm in Sacramento, um, yeah. Yes. So we do have a Pacific Northwest uh, group in, located in Seattle, as well as Southern California. So if you're in those areas, um, we'd love to meet you. Uh, great to meet you digitally. And someday we might meet in person again and do uh, live classes. So uh, this is a, an 11 week series. We're on week two and we're co-hosting um, a series of interactive classes discussing Aleister Crowley's book, Magic Without Tears. Um, and so I do believe, uh, I, I don't know if it shows up for people who came in after, but um, I did share with you guys in the chat, uh, hermetic.com, uh, that library does have uh, all of Magic Without Tears online. It's kind of an expensive book to buy. So, um, you know, if you just want to read it for free, I've been doing that. Um, and uh, so we're going over chapters six, seven, and eight tonight, um, the three schools of magic. Uh, this is pretty ambitious because it's three chapters, um, but I thought that, uh, It'd be cool to do them just like all in one chunk. Uh, it is an essay that someone wrote. Um, <laughs> Crowley hasn't quite claimed it, um, but it is in Magic Without Tears. Um, and so I thought it'd be just fun for us to discuss all three of these chapters. I'm going to try to keep this discussion to half an hour, 45 minutes. So, you know, we don't have to spend all night here, although it'd be fun to stay up till midnight and talk about uh, Magic Without Tears. Um, Rex, did you want to say anything before we get into the like background of these chapters? Uh, no, I don't think so. Let's dive in. Okay, awesome. Um, so I did some research on, uh, you know, uh, like where this came from. Um, if you read it, it starts off chapter six as talking about this figure, uh, Gerard Altman. This He's a French journalist who Crowley is saying wrote this essay. So if you read the Israel Regardi introduction from the 1978 book, Israel Regardi is like, Crowley wrote this essay, not Altman. <laughs> um, there is debate over who actually wrote this essay. I did find, um, I believe, uh, William Breeze uh, from the OTO um, has an, a statement online saying from 2018 saying that Altman actually did write this essay and does attribute authorship to him. Uh, it does appear kind of in other places. Uh, besides Magic Without Tears. So it's kind of controversial. Uh, Altman was uh, Crowley's kind of secretary for a little while. Um, he met him when he was 20 years old. He was a French journalist in Tunisia. And it was after this period where Crowley got kicked out of uh, Sicily. He was uh, at his monastery in Cefalu. And so he was just kind of kicking around uh, North Africa and met this fellow named Altman. And, um, you know, Atman uh, was a journalist, so he was a writer um, and he was a student of Crowley. Um, they were very close at times. Uh, so it's totally possible that, you know, Atman and uh, Crowley kind of collaborated uh, on this essay. I, and maybe Atman made, you know, editorial decisions later. Um, I kind of think that probably is the case. Uh, although there are a lot of statements here that Crowley probably just didn't want to take credit for because there's, it's a pretty controversial essay. <laughs> at times. Um, you know, I, it's funny because uh, 
Israel Vigardi says, I state categorically that Altmont was incapable of writing this particular essay. Every phrase, most turn of expression, the very egocentricity of the point of view, the penetrating comprehension of magic and history are all Crowley and no others. So there's a lot of egocentricity <laughs> in this essay, um, I think you might find. So um, that's kind of my commentary on this sort of weird authorship question. But Crowley puts the whole thing in Magic Without Tears. You know, it's all three chapters. Um, and so it takes up a pretty big chunk. Uh, a lot of people don't think that, you know, if he didn't have a lot to do with this essay, he wouldn't have included it. <laughs> you know, and that's kind of Crowley's ego is pretty big. Um, so yeah, I just, and you know, when I approached it sort of as a beginner five years ago, I was like, oh, this is gonna be, you know, left-hand path, black brotherhood. And it's really not that at all. It's kind of surprising um, what it is about. And, uh, you know, I've kind of, reading it the past week has sort of opened my eyes into what, you know, it, it might have uh, meant to Crowley and why he included it. So, you know, I'm also gonna just preface uh, the introduction and say, you know, from a contemporary standpoint, um, you know, whoever wrote this essay throws out a lot of criticisms on other religions um, that could be considered offensive and, you know, not really very generous. It's a very sort of, uh, essay that criticizes most other <laughs> religions uh, and also other um, sort of schools of thought like theophysy. Uh, you know, he uses some, whoever wrote the essay uses some pretty harsh language um, that might be considered racist. So, you know, just take it with a grain of salt. Um, you know, it was, it was written by a person who had strong opinions and was a person of their time coming, coming out of the Victorian age. You know, this is written in like 1924. So I'm just going to serve you some a healthy dose of salt <laughs> with this essay so uh rex did you want to add anything to that well i think you know if you know if we want to start with the you know chapter six and just kind of dive into it i mean he's talking about kind of opens up with just a, a definition another definition of magic um he calls it the science of the incommensurables which is you know Basically, things it's not apples to apples is what he's trying to say, you know, that, the, that uh, you, you can't really apply hard rules to some of these things. Um, magic investigating the laws of nature in order to use them. Um, he says magic is like science, but it cannot be declared to the profane. He calls magic the mother of science. So he's kind of, he's kind of prefacing the whole the whole thing in this introduction with uh, another definition of magic because if you didn't have enough in the last one too. But um, I, I thought it was interesting just in in general when he's talking about the yellow school or the three schools of magic, you know, and, and he makes it pretty clear that it's you know it's not uh, you can't really read into the colors that are being used. It says they're unfortunate, and I think that's you know I think that's a good point to to make here. Um, yeah, I just want to point out like the, you know, he, he calls uh, magic the mother of science, you know, and we can point that back to like the alchemists, you know, these, these people who sort of invented, um, you know, the scientific method, a lot of them were, you know, alchemists, they were doing experiments and writing things down. And though, you know, a lot of people believe that alchemy is very spiritual, and they were very spiritual people, they also did kind of lay down the uh, groundworks for science. So he's not... Um, wrong or projecting onto onto like you know ancient alchemists or ancient magicians um you know newton had uh alchemy books on his shelves you know and newton's kind of considered the, the chair of the oxford physics department <laughs> you can't get more sciencey than that um right. yeah and also uh john d who was sort of this uh brilliant mathematician scientist um, who invented the enochian system you know he was also very much like a a scientist as much as you could call someone in the Renaissance period. So it's kind of interesting to see like magic develop alongside and with, um, you know, alchemy and science. Yeah. At the same time, he's, um, you know, the, the essay is making a distinction between magic and religion. So it's clearly saying, uh, you know, religion is something else. Religion ignores the laws of nature, whereas magic makes use of that. Religion yeah, tries to es escape escape reality by, you know, putting responsibility on a higher power, and, and that's what 
Yeah, he's really critical of religion in this essay. Whoever wrote it, you know, we can't say it's Crowley for sure, but whoever wrote it was just, you know, like really critical of religion um, in general. Um, and, you know, I, it's interesting just like also just to preface this, you know, Crowley came from that Plymouth Brethren background. And when you read about like, you know, his upbringing, like I don't think he was allowed to read anything except the Bible in his childhood, um, you know, he, I think a lot of his criticisms of religion come from him sort of like projecting all of this really restrictive, uh, you know, childhood, Protestant childhood he had onto religion itself. <laughs> you know, he didn't, he didn't, he, that was his experience of religion and why he was so, you know, against it. Um, so just keeping that in mind, I think is important reading this essay. And then it's interesting because so delving into the text, um, you know, he starts to talk about the vision and the voice, which uh, is Lieber 418 um, and going back to like John D. Uh, so the vision of the voice, it's an amazing book. Um, it was kind of like a received series of received um, text uh, that Crowley um, scried. So scrying, scrying the aethers as you do these uh, you call on the angels using Enochian, the Enochian language, and you you have visions, and you um, you see things, and usually you have a partner. He did this with uh, Victor Neuberg, I believe, uh, mostly in the the North African desert, and you know the early 1900s. And he he's he, this is like a really important text to him. Um, this and like the Book of the Law are two really core texts in Thelema. Um, but this, uh, you know, he, he just quotes it. He's like, yeah, and there's a parable in the vision of the voice that talks about these three schools. Um, and I looked it up. It's from the, the cry of the six aether, which is called Maz. And, uh, you know, if, if uh, anyone wants to check it out, I'll put, post it in the text. Um, this is just super cool. Uh, you know, if you haven't read the vision of the voice, um, I would really recommend it as a mystical text. You know, it, it's one of those things where the more you read it and the more you get into it and the more you read his commentaries like the deeper it goes it's 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 amazing uh, it's one of my favorite things uh and so um the cry of the six aether uh he talks about you know this uh three schools and he talks about how he kind of sees these three magis and you know what is it one is in white and he's like hiding his shame and one is walking sideways and um one is uh totally naked and he's walking forward and, you know, it's this visionary thing, but then he references it in this essay, or Altmont re references it in this essay. Um, and it's, there's a footnote uh, in the vision of the voice um, to this particular parable. It says, this doctrine of the three schools is of extreme interest. Roughly, it may be said that white is pure mystic, whose attitude to God is one of reference. The yellow school conceals the mysteries indeed, but examines them as it goes. And the black school is that of pure skepticism. Um, so, you know, and he, he that's in, in the, uh, the Magic Without Tears uh, essay, you know, so we have him sort of quoting from uh, this other mystical text, interesting. Um, and then the author, you know, of the essay goes on to warn against like taking it too literally um, and like saying that the, the parable was invented by an intelligence of the black school, <laughs> um, which is just really like fascinating. Um, yeah. And it kind of gives you a sense of like the inner workings of these mystery schools, like they're all battling each other and trying to obfuscate the truth and doing different things. I don't know, it kind of gave it an interesting spin. Yeah, Stephen Brent is saying, it seems to me that the magician must at various times adopt one or more attitudes of each of the three schools. You know, the parable is interesting because he kind of relates it to the three magi of, uh, you know, the sort of the nativity, you know, following a star. So yeah, they, and, and when you read their essay, they do kind of seem to really come together as, you know, sort of, I don't know, three sides of the same coin. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's an interesting point because it is, there are aspects of all three schools that are that are positive and that can be useful, you know. But it's like if one of them gets too extreme, uh, it's they start beating down the other two. You know, it's like this battle between three forces, and uh, the yellow school is trying to keep the balance. The black school seems to be wanting to gain power in some way, and the white school is is uh, Rosicrucianism basically. 
too. So it's kind of more of the mystical side of things. But um, yeah, it's an interesting, um, like a three-way battle, like a cage fight. <laughs> Um, so, and then he goes on to sort of talk about uh, the yellow school of magic in the first chapter, um, the first part of that essay. And, uh, you know, he, he relates to the yellow school of magic, uh, you know, to um, basically Taoism. He says the yellow school of magic possesses one perfect classic, the Tao Te Ching, um, and it inculcates uh, conscious inaction or rather unconscious inaction the object of minimizing the disorder of the world. So, um, you know, Tao teaching, a lot of it is just about balance and sort of accepting, um, you know, what comes and using it if you can. Um, so it's it's kind of fascinating that he said, he, that's what he starts off with is the yellow school. He defines it as, you know, sort of in line with Taoism. Um, and then there's also a footnote in uh, Magic Without Tears that points us to chapter 35 of Magic Without Tears, um, where uh, he talks about the translation of uh, Alistair Crowley's translation of uh, the Tao Te Ching. Um, so apparently he was really into Taoism. Um, I thought it was interesting too, when uh, the statement that he said that Taoism has as little to do with the Tao Te Ching as the Catholic Church with the gospel. So he's, he's kind of, Making a definite, uh, you know, distinction between again, you know, kind of slamming religion, slamming formal religious thought to the more pure form of that's contained in, in the Tao Te Ching. And Kristen says it was cool that in the beginning he seemed to be differentiating sacredness, reverence, holiness, divinity from religion. That holiness doesn't need the confines of religious dogma. Yes, yeah, he really um, does separate out sacred from religion, you know. Um, and then, uh, so I just, you know, just moving forward into the next uh, chapter, chapter seven, um, you know, he talks about the, the black school. Um, and, you know, like I said, when I approached this essay years ago, I thought it would be about like the left-hand path and evil. <laughs> and it's really, it's really not that, um, you know, it's really kind of him talking about uh, like schools that are very invested in sort of uh, the material world as like the end be all and, and end all. Um, you know, the material world is like this suffering and this sorrow. Um, you know, like he talks a lot about sort of the, the Buddhist uh, idea, one of the Four Noble Truths is that, you know, existence is suffering, um, which arises from desire. But to me, you know, I kind of feel like he's coming from, you know, his own uh, Christian background of original sin um, as a reaction, you know, sort of you are you are destined uh, to be a sinner and, you know, unless you redeem yourself somehow uh, and, you know, you're going to go to hell, you know, you were born into this, you know, humanity, which has sinned, <laughs> you know, before you're even born, you're, you know, kind of has is very fatalistic. Um, you know, that's sort of what I was getting from it is, you know, this black school is really about like, you know, existence is suffering. Well, yeah, suffering and sin and some of the other things that go into some of the religions that get slammed here. Um, I think that, you know, he's trying in part of this second chapter or in chapter seven, um, you know, he's defining the black school as being you know, stuck in the, uh, in the material world, matter is evil, everything is sorrow, and all of the, <clears throat> the religions that come out of those, those thoughts, you know, those ideas. But then um, I thought it was interesting towards the middle and the end, it almost became, you know, we started talking about the white school and um, how parts of the white school are, are intermixed with the black school and, and uh, it's more like the spirituality side of the religion um, is when the white school is present. And when it's not present, all you've got is just the, the structure, the dogma, mm -hmm. the, the kind of empty, hollow rituals. Yeah. And the more I was reading this essay, the more I kind of, I was like, why is it black and white and yellow? And um, I sort of, you know, synthesized that uh, perhaps, you know, it was a, a metaphor for, you know, Kether you know, Kabbalistically on the tree of life, Kether would be considered white, 
Malkuth is like considered black, you know, on the other side of the tree. So there's the polarity is on the middle pillar and in the middle is yellow, Tiferet, and it's, you know, school of balancing. So um, to me, there's a little bit of that sort of, you know, he's talking about Kabbalah, even though he's using, uh, you know, different ideas of religion and power um, to do it, uh, you know, which yeah. I think, I, I, <laughs> I don't know, he's, he, the second essay, he's very critical of religion, though, he just really trashes, like, you, you know, a lot of different uh, religions. Um, it's interesting. He does. He does find. Uh, he does find that the tantric portions um, of, like, the Hindus and there are schools of Buddhism that are tantric. He he does find value in them, um, and I think that's a really interesting thing uh, to consider. Um, you know, tantric. Uh, it's funny because everyone equates like tantric practices with sex, but they're not um, just sex. It's tantric practices are often about like pushing, uh, pushing the bounds of the material world uh, into a way where all of a sudden like what is weird or disgusting or off-putting becomes holy. Um, it's kind of how I would summate uh, tantric practices. Like there's, there's practices where tantric yogis go to like graveyards and you know kind of interact with like corpses you know there's they're very very intense and you know they're they're <laughs> they're pretty controversial um but you know it is that extreme you know which i think crowley really loved extremes of interacting with the material world in a way where you weren't rejecting any of it you know it is kind of like that concept uh, where you reject nothing um so I thought that was, yeah, he has a little quote about it where, what is it? The tantric is not obsessed by the will to die. It is a difficult business, no doubt, to get any fun out of existence, but at least it is not impossible. In other words, he implicitly denies the fundamental proposition that existence is sorrow, and he formulates the essential postulate of the white school of magic. That means existence exist by which the universal sorrow apparent indeed to all in ordinary observation may be unmasked even as the initiatory rite of isis in the ancient days of chem there a neophyte presenting his mouth under compulsion to the pouting buttocks of a goat of mendez found himself caressed by the chaste lips of a virginal priestess of that goddess at the base whose shrine is writ no man has lifted her veil um, yeah, tantric can, tantric can refer to uh, sacred texts. Um, uh, interesting in the author criticism of religion. Yeah, so I, you know, it's just funny because he attacks a lot of uh, sort of religions, but I think in the end, you know, it, it just seems like he's, you know, really referring to that very Malkuth and Malkuth only, you know, grounding in the earth, but only seeing, you know, being blind to the the light of Kether, you know, being blind to everything except the material world. Um, it might be no sacred scarab Korob says it might be of worth uh, of worth noting that Crowley's definition of the left hand path is a bit purgative. Eastern left hand path practices of strong tendencies to transcending materials. So Savag Borga's Agora gives a good example. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, we can't I, I feel like a lot of this essay was written almost either in sort of an ignorance or a willful misunderstanding of a lot of sort of Eastern <laughs> traditions and practices. So um, that's my critique uh, is just that it, I think he was trying to prove a point, but he wasn't necessarily being generous. Um, so that's, that's my little critique on the prophet. <laughs> Uh, so Stephen Brandt says, so the supposed deception intrigue mentioned around the black school in the previous chapter could be seen as a bogus cover story of Satanism, where it's really just hyper skeptical materialism. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could say that, you know, I think um, at least modern schools of Satanism are very materialistic, you know, and they like it that way, you know, it's, 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 it's cool, you know. Um, and there's nothing wrong really with like deceiving people because, you know, uh, morality is in the material world. It's not like a ideal. Um, so it's 
probably one of the strengths of this course, Magic Without Tears, lend itself well to responses, whether or not you're understanding or wise as Crowley, you have the advantage of a hundred years of hindsight. Yes, we do. <laughs> Scarab <laughs> core, yes, we do. All right, so moving on, um, so in the second essay, he also goes into the white school. Um, and, you know, he defines uh, the white school as existence is pure joy, sorrow is caused by a failure to perceive this fact, but it is not misfortune, we have invented sorrow, which does not matter so much after all, in order to have the exuberant satisfaction of getting rid of it. Existence is thus a sacrament. Sounds a lot like, uh, you know, some things from the Book of the Law, I guess. Would you say, Rex? Yeah, I think I think I think that's kind of what we see in this in this chapter where he's going with the whole thing. Um, definitely bringing up Thelema as the hero, um, who's going to save the situation that you know this this battle between the three schools, um, as it's been defined so far, and then um we've got uh you know the interaction between the three schools and then the yellow school generally lets the black and white schools fight it out um but only occasionally taking action in order to restore the, the balance but then he kind of says in this chapter the rise of or he portrays the rise of christianity as a, a failure of the white school as the black school has taken taken over um and I, I, I found it kind of amusing, just the drama here, just the, the, how the Yellow School sent Blavatsky and the Theopos Theosophical Society in an, an attempt to weaken the Black School, but that seemed to not work too well. Um, and so then the, they, the, the, yellow, the Yellow School conspires with the chiefs of the White School to bring out the Lima, to bring out a new prophet. Yeah, <laughs> he starts, he starts, uh, you know, talking about this sort of, yeah, drama, this story, you know, about Blavatsky and, um, you know, he kind of, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I would understand, you know, uh, why Crowley might not want to put his name on this because, you know, the, the eighth chapter does get pretty crazy. Um, as far as like other schools, uh, you know, the Theosophical School, he he basically accuses, uh, you know, Annie Besant of being, a, you know, black in the black school. And um, he says a, you know, racially charged uh, degradatory thing towards uh, Krishnamurti, um, which I was Ouch. really bummed out about. I, I really love Krishnamurti. Um, so if, if, for people who aren't aware, uh, so the Theosophical School, you know, after Blavatsky, uh, died, um, you know, it was uh, Annie Besant and Ledbetter decided to find like a world teacher. And uh, they actually found these two boys uh, who were living in India. Um, they were, I think, like, you know, eight, nine, ten, um, that age. And they took them, uh, you know, and, and basically were like, you guys are going to be our, our world teachers. And they raised them, you know, they, they took them, I believe they took them to England from India, they took them from their families and taught them you know, everything they could and educated them. And then uh, one of the brothers uh, died, um, but the other one, um, you know, lived and he was going to be their, their world teacher, their prophet, uh, Jay Krishnamurti. And yeah, he, uh, he was given the order of the Eastern Star or whatever. And, you know, like, you know, is the day they gave it to him, he sort of stood on the platform and said, truth is a pathless land. And I'm not going to lead you, you have to lead yourself. And sort of broke up the band <laughs> and walked away <laughs> from this school. Uh, and, you know, he gave lectures, um, you know, all through his life. Uh, yeah, like a rock star, exactly. Uh, you know, he was um, just a really, really interesting person. I, I think on YouTube, I found some, uh, you know, talks he had given at Esalon. And so if you don't know Krishnamurti, he's a really interesting person. He, he really did, uh, stick to the truth as a path of land and you know just really like uh, uh focused on sort of self um sort of meditation on your own thoughts and your own self and uh he's he's great so but the interesting thing so bringing it back to like this text is that he was sort of being touted as he was going to be this world leader and 
a lot of people think that Crowley was jealous. <laughs> and he actually, there's a, a footnote that says, you know, the master Therion smote him. <laughs> Um, and and I think this essay was written around this, you know 1924 was a time when Crowley was trying to become the world teacher, so he saw Krishnamurti as his competition. Um, so it makes sense as to why this essay might have been written not by Crowley, but by you know a, a Crowley associate who was trying to, you know, sort of say, well, Crowley is the world teacher, um, which doesn't doesn't you know negate the fact that he talks about why Thelema should be this like resolution um, in this third essay to like the black and white schools um, why it kind of brings uh, all of this together he mentions Rosicrucianism uh, the Rosicrucians um, you know for those of you who uh, haven't studied Rosicrucian movement they were kind of uh, in the 17th century, I believe, in Germany, um, sort of these manifestos appeared, uh, the Fama uh, Fraternitas RC, um, the fame of the brotherhood, um, and the chemical wedding of uh, Christian Rosen, uh, Rosencross. Um, and uh, Crowley was actually part of the Hermetic Golden Dawn, uh, which was sort of a offshoot of Rosicrucianism, um, you know, Rosicrucianism is sort of a, a, a graded lodge system that's sort of what it evolved into and kind of the Masons sort of took a little bit of it and you know it's, it's one of those secret orders. Uh, uh, wasn't Golden Dawn founded as a response to the Theosophical exotism and emphasis on theory versus practice? Um, you know I'm not sure Stephen uh, if that was um, you know one of the reasons they found it, it's it's certainly possible. Um, you know, I'm I'm not totally sure, but something we could definitely investigate. Um, you know, there's always going to be people sort of co having controversy and fighting when it comes to joining these secret societies. You know, there's lots of splits and differences in uh, theory and dogma and practice, for sure. Um, but yeah, it's just really fascinating that he kind of opens it up uh, with Rosicrucianism in this third essay, part of the essay. And I think, it, you know, coming back to the material versus the spiritual, uh, it's interesting that he talks about the Rosicrucian, uh, he says the central symbol of the Rosicrucians, the barren cross on which he has made a rose to flower, occupies himself primarily with spiritual and physiological alchemy, uh, taking the first matter of the work as a neutral or inert substance, it is con constantly described as the commonest and least valued thing on earth and may actually connotate any substance, whatever. He deliberately poisons it, as uh, so to speak, bringing to the stage of transmutation generally called the black dragon. And he proceeds to work upon this virulent poison until he obtains the perfection theoretically possible. So, um, you know, coming back to just like that, the black school and the white school and the tension in between, you know, the Rosicrucians uh, literally as their emblem have the cross, you know, the cross of matter with this rose blooming out from it. I think too, it was, it struck me in this last chapter, um, the way it portrays the Lima as the, the resolve, the resolution of the, of the battle. So, it, you know, with the, the idea of, do what thou wilt, and um, if each school is doing their will, then they shouldn't be in such conflict. Um, and the same way for individuals, it's it's the same. Like if we're doing our our true will, then uh, as we talked about last week, we, there tends to be less conflict because everyone is doing what they're supposed to be doing. I thought that was an interesting um, way of bringing Philema into the into that that milieu of of the three schools. Yeah, he kind of presents, so at the end of, you know, this essay, he presents sort of Philema as the answer, <laughs> which mm -hmm. I was kind of entertained by. And it, it, it is funny, it's like, Crowley didn't write this, so Crowley gets to say that Crowley is the, 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 the person with the, with the answer. Um, you know, uh, the new magical formula um, is the answer. And this is the law, the law of Philema, and it summarizes with the four wor words, do what thou wilt. Um, and, you know, it's funny because it is a little, to me, proselytizing, 
<laughs> this part of the essay being like, hey, have you heard the good word? <laughs> Which I kind of bristle at frequently when I people get a little too, you know, I have a pamphlet for you. <laughs> so, um, but but he comes back to his point, um, which I think is totally beautiful and valid, uh, you know, and the, to me kind of sums up the, the essay is that um, it, the law shows that the joy of existence is not in the goal for that is that indeed is clearly unattainable, but in the going itself. Um, the joy of existence is in the going. And to me, I, I love that because, you know, one of the fifth powers, one of the powers of the Sphinx, the fifth power is to go. Um, and I believe there's in an, another essay in Magic Without Tears where he talks about that power of the Sphinx to go. And it, it is to transform, you know, it is the constant transformation that is, you know, existence itself. Um, and that kind of like is the, to me was like the core of the essay and brought it really home in a spiritual way to me. I was like, okay, well, yeah. And I had a feel good ending at the end. Have you heard the good word of the law? <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Um, and then, yeah, he, he goes on, you know, he, he ends the essay. Um, you know, he says, this is the process, uh, what it's meant by initiation. Um, that is to say, to going into oneself, making one's peace, so to speak, with all the forces that one finds there. Um, so, you know, despite all this, like, uh, there's black schools and white schools and yellow schools, uh, you know, it is that finding within yourself, you know, the, the uh, as below part, as above, so below. Um, and then he, he goes on, he writes a little postscript to the letter um, to end it. He says, our, our own school unites the ruby red of blood with the gold of the sun. It combines the best characteristics of the yellow and the white schools. Um, in the light of uh, Mr. Amant's exposition, it is easy to understand. Um, to, to us, every phenomenon is an act of love. Every experience is necessary, is a sacrament, is a means of growth. Hence, existence is pure joy. A feast every day in your hearts and the joy of my rapture. A feast every night unto new and the pleasure of uttermost delight. Let it soak in. <laughs> kind of, a, that's the feel good ending, I think. Um, so I'm just going to open it up if anyone has anything, uh, you know, they want to talk about reactions, please. Um, Christian says, what's your favorite line. school? <laughs> I, 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 unless I'm wrong, I, didn't Crowley later in his life pretty much just whole, um, really dive into uh, yellow school practices into um, into the Taoist and Buddhist practices and uh and and to me it, it does seem like his only his only beef with that attitude was that it was lacking in in will or force it was too disengaged or too dispassionate and he says somewhere in here that he brought philema brings force back to the uh back to the yellow school you know um mm -hmm. so it seems like he was always in sympathy with that he wanted to avoid the the polarity of the black and white schools you know the unquestioning mysticism and reverence on one end and the the base materialism or skepticism of the black school and that the the yellow schools served as that 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 middle that middle middle way you know that just needed a little bit more um, a little bit more force behind it to be effective I, I think that's a good point and i think that's kind of what he's saying here too at the end where he's saying our school unites the ruby red of blood with the gold of the sun and the best characteristics characteristics of the yellow and the white schools. I think that kind of speaks to what you're saying there. I think you're right. I think he was always interested in Eastern studies, I Ching and, and the Tao Te Ching. Yeah, I mean, he literally did a translation of the Tao Te Ching. So, you know, it was, it, right. yeah, he always, he always borrowed from them. And I, I think, you know, he didn't, I mean, maybe he didn't write this essay. <laughs> maybe it was all, you know, Gerard Altman, we don't know. Um, but I, I do love just coming back to like, you know, the Kabbalistic interpretation of bringing, you know, the white school of spirit down into, you know, the black school of matter and the, the mediating force of Tifereth in between. 
um, you know, I think that as a as a metaphor for these three schools is is really a powerful sort of realization I had reading these essays. Stephen said, I would have to say Thelema includes a heaping help of skepticism. <laughs> it should. It definitely should. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if it is based on science, you know, if you are trying to have that in scientific illuminism perspective, then, you know, if, if you're a scientist who isn't skeptical, you might not be a very good scientist, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I agree. Anyone else have anything that struck them during this essay? Thank you for joining us for the three chapters. I mean, that, that was, was a lot. A long yeah. I think Rex and I are both kind of sweating it. I know I was before. I was like, oh man. <laughs> but it was a good follow up from last week. You know, we talked about the, <clears throat> the definitions of magic and then we come into the three schools of magic with their own definitions. Like, they seem to dovetail really well. Yeah, I think um, I was thinking, so next week, you know, uh, 6.30, same time, Wednesday, um, we might discuss chapter 12, which is the left-hand path. Um, you know, just because I was like, oh, well, how come we're not talking about the left-hand path? <laughs> so um, I'll post it on Facebook. Uh, if anybody, I, I'm not sure I'm going to email the, the email public list all the time. Um, but if anybody wants me to email them, uh, you know, each chapter or a reminder, um, I'm going to post my email in the chat box. Uh, just You can just email me um, and just let me know you want updates. Um, and, but I'll mostly be posting this stuff on uh, our Facebook groups. So um, thank you everyone for joining us again. This has been a really fun, um, fun to discuss. And yeah, chapter 12 uh, next week, we'll get into the, the, the left hand path. <laughs> awesome, looking forward to it. Thanks everyone for being thank here. Thank you, yeah. Thank you.